Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today and all of us here at ACES. My name is Madison Plunkert, and I'm a naturalist here at the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. Um, naturalist Nights is a 10-week free speaker series in the Roaring Fork Valley hosted by a partnership between Wilderness Workshop, ACES, and the Roaring Fork Audubon. Talks are hosted each week through early March in Carbondale at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays and here at ACES at 6 p.m. on Thursdays. Um, we encourage you to check out the displays and the literature on the tables out front where you signed in. Um, if you didn't sign in yet, please do. It helps us take, um, keep track of the people that we're getting these talks out to. Um, and our sponsors very much appreciate it. And here are our sponsors. Special shout out to them. And a shout out to the Aspen Square Hotel. Um, these businesses provide financial and in-kind donations which cover travel expenses for our speakers and the cost of having Grassroots TV video the presentations making Naturalist Nights possible. So thank you to Grassroots TV. Um, they air our presentations on Channel 12 Up Valley and Channel 82 Down Valley. Videos will also be available on our websites and social media feeds in the coming week. We also live stream each of the Naturalist Night speakers on Wednesday or Thursday evening, both Wilderness Workshops and ACES Facebook pages, so make sure to check them out. Um, if you are an educator, you can continue your education through a certificate by coming to our presentations, and you get an hour for each of those presentations. There's no minimum necessary, but you can get up to 10 hours, so be sure to sign in for that. And jumping ahead to next week, we will have Van K. Graham from Colorado Parks and Wildlife with his talks about the greater sandhill cranes in Colorado's high country. But not to get too far ahead, we still have tonight's speaker. Um, I would like to introduce Kat Bernier. As an enthusiastic naturalist and wildlife field research biologist, Kat Bernier has walked, worked with Colorado Parks and Wildlife for the past seven years. The majority of her work has been in the Alpine, collecting data and answering questions about the white-tailed ptarmigan under the guidance of Amy Segland, Species Conservation Coordinator for the state. While not on the job working to conserve wildlife, she loves exploring wild lands, backpacking, wildlife watching, and all forms of skiing in the US and internationally. It's an honor to welcome Kat, and thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, additionally, in conjunction, additionally in, uh, to my biography, in conjunction with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and University of California at Santa Cruz, I will begin a master's program in conservation next year. I'm pretty excited about that. And it will be on another alpine species, the brown-capped rosy finch. So maybe I can come and talk to you guys about that <laughs> sometime in the future. Um, as, as the biography said, my supervisor, Amy Seglin, she was the primary research biologist on this seven-year project. She wasn't able to make it here this evening, so she gave me the honor of giving the talk in her absence. I will present this in two different parts. The first half of the presentation will be kind of a natural and life history of white-tailed ptarmigan. The second half will kind of outline the Colorado Parks and Wildlife project and findings for the seven years of our study. So I'd like to begin. I'm sure you all know what the Alpine is. I'm sure you've all been there. And as ecologists in the state, we call it alpine tundra. Tundra being from the Russian word for the land of no trees. And what's a little bit different in, here in Colorado is the land of no trees is actually the land above the trees. Um, tundra is typically thought of, you know, Arctic, Siberia, Greenland, and it's a marshy expanse of grassland with areas of permanently frozen ground. 
But like I said, here in Colorado, it's really defined by that upper tree line, that Krumholtz limit, where those dwarf trees kind of peter out, get shorter, and um, you see pretty much the expanse open up because of that temperature regimen throughout the year. The alpine does correspond to approximately a 50 degree Fahrenheit isotherm. So the warmest summer month is usually July and the average temperature is 50 degrees in July. And the alpine is subject to extreme weather con conditions throughout the year, high solar radiation, cold temperatures, up to 80 mile per hour winds in the winter. And then also, as you can see from, these are the needle mountains in the San Juan range. Um, extreme topography. There is an extremely short growing season. Generally speaking, the growing season is from about early to mid-June through approximately late, to mid, late August to mid-September. And during mid-September, you start to see, you know, the snows start coming in right around the uh, autumnal equinox we typically see a six to 10 inch snowstorm. And by that point, all of the leaves start to senesce. We see that uh, reddish golden brown coming, color coming into the foliage on the ground. And another uh, portion of the alpine, or another factor in the alpine is those severe afternoon thunderstorms in Colorado. And those are caused by the heating of the lowland grounds, uh, rising the moisture, rising the temperature, and that orographic lifting effect dropping the, all of the moisture up into the mountains. And what all of this extreme topography and uh, extreme weather means is that there are tiny microclimates up there. There are micro refugia and tons of different vegetative communities. We have alpine grasslands and meadows where the wildflowers are blooming, wildflowers galore. The fell fields or the windswept areas have there are different cushion plant communities and mat forming plant communities. And then on the steeper slopes, we have dryad communities, those little white rose flowers in the dry wind swept, wind swept slopes. We also have snow bed communities that are home to sedges, rushes, and tons of soil lichens. We have <laughs> alpine wetland communities. You see flowers such as the bright pink elephant head, sedges, marsh marigolds, and then as demonstrated here in this next photo, there are huge swaths of talus, rock, and scree. You'll notice that red circle. I'm just trying to give you an idea, the landscape scale idea of where we're conducting our research. This is from Rock Lake, also in the San Juan Mountains. It's about a 1500 vertical rise from the lake up to the top of the ridge. And if we zoom in really quick, that is one of our researchers. That's actually Amy Segland, who spearheaded this whole project. So once again, from the large scale to the small scale. And this is the type of landscape where we're trying to find ptarmigan, these little tiny alpine chickens. <laughs> in Colorado, we are blessed to have 25% of the alpine in the lower 48. So you think Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, they have the other 75%. But as one state, we have you know, a vast majority uh, concentrated here. Nearly 3%, 2.8% of the Alpine uh, encompass is encompassed in the state. It equates to about 2,900 square miles of Alpine. And I think the greatest feature of that is 90% of it is public land. So public lands being protected, you know, l more restricted for what uses can uh, take place on them. But in addition to that, 55% is designated wilderness. So no additional mining will take place, no additional road building, no permanent structures, no permanent dwellings, nothing. So for the plants and animals that live in those wilderness areas, you know, that's an added measure of production, protection that we're really excited about. Some other common species we find in the alpine. The top left here is the brown-capped rosy finch. We've started conducting research on those already. Up in the top right, we have kind of a flagship species, the American pica. There, you know, if, you, if he's not gathering foliage for his haystacks, he's probably saying, Shmee! and alarming everyone that he's there. 
We have the Colorado State Mammal, the Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep. And then in the bottom right, you might love them, you might hate them, the yellow-bellied marmot, also known as the whistle pig. Worldwide, there are three species of ptarmigan found. The rock ptarmigan is there on the left with those big red bushy eye combs. On the right, we have the willow ptarmigan. And you can see the distribution of the rock ptarmigan here. It's pretty much all through the Arctic, all through Siberia, over in Alaska. But it doesn't extend as far northward as, say, the willow ptarmigan, which extends up into the Baffin Islands, over in Greenland, and then a lot of these northern reaches of uh, Europe as well, up in Scandinavia. And the white-tailed ptarmigan is the only species of ptarmigan that is restricted exclusively to North America. You can see all the way from Alaska, down through the Yukon, down through British Columbia, parts of Alberta, and then little pockets coming down following the Rocky Mountain chain all the way down to portions of New Mexico. These little black stars you see on the map, those are where white-tailed ptarmigan were introduced in the 1970s. So uh, individuals, usually uh, monogamous pairs, were captured and then transported and released in these other areas, Oregon, California. I want to say it was the Wallowa Mountains in Oregon, the Sierras in California, the Uintas in Utah. The star in Colorado here was actually Pikes Peak, where they didn't previously <coughs> exist, and then down in the mountains kind of north of Santa Fe in New Mexico. So the diagnostics of the white-tailed ptarmigan are those white retrices. The other two species of ptarmigan have black tail feathers, even in the winter. Um, and the white-tailed ptarmigan has those white retrices, the white tail feathers, all year round. And they are the smallest grouse species. They're about 350 grams, and that equates to right around 12 ounces. So just little handheld birds, slightly less than a pound. The name ptarmigan is from the Scottish Gaelic. The original word was tarmachan. Literally, it means croaker. And uh, later, the P was added, influenced by the Greek for the word wing or pinion, wing, feather, or pinion, the word pteron, P-T-E-R-O-N. And I'd like to ask you, as an audience, why you can't hear a ptarmigan go to the bathroom. Because the P is silent. There are five recognized subspecies of white-tailed ptarmigan extending from the Peninsularis subspecies in Alaska and down through the Alaskan islands. We have Lagopus leucura leucura uh, extending from the Yukon down through British Columbia and Alberta and then a little down through Glacier National Park and into Montana. The Saxitalis, that green subspecies, that's the very specific Vancouver Island subspecies. The Raniriensis, those are the very specific uh, kind of Rainier Range Washington subspecies. And then down here in Colorado, as well as extending down through New Mexico, it is Lagopus leucura altipetens. And over in Utah, that's that little introduced population uh, in the Uintas. And the name Lagopus leucura, Lagopus being from Latin, Lagos is meaning hair, Pus meaning foot, so referring to their, their highly feathered feet in winter. And leucura is from Latinized Greek. Leucos means white, ura means tail. So their entire name, Lagopus leucura, describes the species kind of in one little container. The distribution of ptarmigan in Colorado, you can see up in kind of the northwest portion, the zircles down south and west of there are the flat tops. And then all the way from the Rewas to the Never Summers, down through the entire Front Range, the 10 Mile Range, the Gore Range, down here in the White River National Forest, all the way over into the Collegiates and the West Elks down through the Sangres, down through the southern Sangres, into New Mexico, and then the entire San Juan mountain range complex. Now a little life history about white-tailed ptarmigan, and I'll kind of go through the annual cycle for white-tailed ptarmigan. 
They do molt their feathers eight months out of the year, so it's a huge energy sink, molting feathers constantly, and they do that to maintain their camouflage, their biggest defense mechanism. So in the winter, they do turn all white, and as the spring approaches, they get into their nuptial plumage, where you see that sexual dimorphism, the males and the females look different from each other. And then towards the fall, they undergo another molt, and they turn kind of this grayish brown color and start to grow in the white feathers, and that's their third molt of the year. They're extremely well adapted to long, harsh winters here in Colorado, and one of their primary adaptations is that they burrow down underneath the snow. They use those sharp, sharp claws to dig down into bushes, into willow bushes, and other types of bushes up in the alpine. And that keeps them warm, and it also provides a food source when they burrow down into the willow bushes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the winds can be extreme in the alpine in the winter, up to 80 miles an hour, so a lot of times, you'll have a big snow event, and you won't see any ptarmigan tracks anywhere on the snow. You'll be skiing or snowshoeing along, and all of a sudden, poof, ptarmigan explode out of the snow, seemingly from nowhere. And that's because they were burrowed down, staying protected, staying warm from the harsh winter elements. As the name implies, their feet and legs are covered by these short feathers. The short feathers kind of protect them from the snow, from ice buildup, and they also act as snowshoes to stay aloft on that soft, luffy snow. Their winter diet consists of nutri nutritious buds, of buds and twigs of willow bushes. And like I was mentioning, they burrow down. It's very typical to, to burrow down into their food source. They rest up to 80% of the day, and they nibble on twigs and buds the other 20% of the time. But when they burrow down in those soft snow areas in the bushes, the food source is right there for energy conservation, so they can actually gain weight in the winter. A master of camouflage. You may be hiking in the alpine and three feet away from a ptarmigan, and you would no be none the wiser. Has everyone in the room seen a white-tailed ptarmigan in the alpine? Excellent. You, you all must have extremely good eyes. Only when they burst out and play with Phyllis. <laughs> exactly. Only when they pop up. So you may wonder, you know, as researchers, how are we trying to find them? How are we trying to estimate abundance? How are we going about this in such an extensive habitat? And I'll zoom in. There is a ptarmigan in this picture. I couldn't find it. But if we zoom in, maybe, maybe we can see it in the fog. Maybe we, we, we might need to zoom in just a skosh more. There it is, almost perfectly blended in with the background. So when we're training new field technicians every year, we like to play a little game called, how many ptarmigan are in this picture? <laughs> Do we have any guesses? All right, all right, you, you all nailed it. For anyone that didn't see all three, we have one here, one here, one here. But I'm going to make the game a little bit harder. How many ptarmigan do you see in this picture? All right, I've got a, I've got a three, I've got a four, a five, a six. Six is absolutely right. <laughs> we have the ptarmigan mama in the forefront here, and these are five of her chicks. This was a very successful mother. They're about half grown, half into adult recruitment there. Okay, okay, I'm going to make it really hard now. How many ptarmigan are in this photo? Okay, we've got a six. Any others? We've got seven. How about 10? <laughs> and I can tell you this is from Ice Lake in the San Juan Mountains. I took this photo just after sunrise. 
There are actually 13 birds in this photo, but when I reviewed it later, I couldn't find 13 birds either. We could only find 10. So they are masters of camouflage. They're extremely cryptic. Their biggest defense is to not fly. Their biggest defense is to just hunker down and sit still. But once you find them, they can be extremely tame. This is one of our technicians that worked on the project for all seven years, Lee Kaiser. And this is at Rocky Mountain National Park. And this, you can see the, their banded pair, little leg bands there and there. And you can almost reach out and touch them. There he is again. There are three ptarmigan in this picture. I won't torture you anymore. Let's see, where are they, though? There's one there, one there, and to the right. To the right. I can't even see it from here. So a little more of their life history. Unlike other bird species that may have a northern and southern migration, you know, moving to the north to breed and then down to Mexico or the Bahamas or Central America in winter for a warm winter, these guys actually just migrate about 1,500 feet from upslope to downslope. This photo is taken uh, again at Rock Lake up here, kind of towards the ridge line. That is our study site. And in the winter, they really just move down to these lowland willow bottomlands. And this is a different perspective of kind of the same photo. This is also from Rock Lake. And you can see not far to fly for a safe winter. So as spring approaches, there are longer days, a longer photo period per day. The snow melt uh, starts to begin. And the longer days, as well as the snow melt, it's kind of a, a multifaceted uh, mechanism, creates the molt into their nuptial plumage. The, uh, this is also the time where the breeding territory is established. So if you've ever been in the Alpine, kind of in the early morning, maybe in the spring, you may have heard this sound, the male territorial call. And that's a very, very characteristic thing to hear up in the Alpine. And that's a male potentially flying, protecting his territory, and also protecting his female. So they do molt into this sexually dimorphic nuptial plumage. You can see the male up here. The male is a more cinnamon rusty brown on the back, and he does retain the white belly feathers all year. The females are more of this golden barred brown, and they do have that golden barring all throughout the belly feathers, so that's one of the diagnostic characteristics. And you would think, a lot of grouse species, the males have an eye comb, a very pronounced eye comb that they flash during mating, but that's actually not a diagnos diagnostic characteristic between the males and females in ptarmigan. As you can see, the female here, she's slightly alarmed, also has that little red eye comb. The males will generally have a much larger one, and they're more suspect to flashing it, but the females also have one. So that's not, uh, it's not set in stone for telling the males from the females. There we have another mated pair, the male flashing his eye comb on the left, and the female kind of raising her crown in alarm on the right. She's running away from us. There we have another mated pair. They are considered a mostly monogamous species, and we typically saw, it was very common to see mated pairs going back to the same mates year after year, same territories, same areas, same nesting grounds, same <coughs> everything. We actually had a pair up at our Mount Yale site, one of my favorite mated pairs that we tracked around for years, and we named all of our birds because naming them with numbers, we couldn't remember anything. So Derek and Jackie up at Mount <laughs> Yale. <laughs> and Derek and Jackie, they were an old school couple. They went back to the same rock outcroppings, had the same nesting grounds, did the same mating dance, and chased off Jean-Pierre, the same intruding male, every single year. <laughs> 
So on to nesting. This is another one of our radio collared birds. This is, some of you may or may not recognize it, this. It's taken from Independence Pass. We had a site up there for seven years of our study. And this little bird, very successful mother, her name was Liz. You can see her sitting on her nest of five eggs. They do incubate their eggs for between 22 and 24 days. 24 days is pretty average for their hatch. And typical to all bird species, they do develop this brood patch to keep the eggs warm as they're incubating, and then also to brood their young after the young come off. So, the interesting thing about this photo, you'll notice the very shallow nest bowl. Generally, ptarmigan just dig out with their claw, a little shallow depression in the ground, and they'll line it with a few twigs and some soft grasses, maybe a few feathers, but really nothing very fancy. But what's so incredible about this photo is that one egg is cleanly hatched out. And you can look at that and you can, you can see those well-defined margins. A chick did hatch out of there. It pecked out with its egg tooth. But the other four eggs haven't hatched out. And what's so curious about that is that's very rare. Our egg viability from counted eggs was extremely high. It was about 95%. But these four eggs have not hatched. So the researcher that found this nest came upon it mid-hatch. So there was one chick and mama probably six feet away just waiting for the other chicks to come out. The hatch does, all of the eggs are laid between 24 and 36 hours apart. And she does lay eggs for about a seven day period before she sits down and starts incubating them. And they do amazingly all come off pretty much at the same, within the same 24 hour period. So on to brood rearing. These little birds are incredible. That little bird is probably about two days old. That rock is maybe 45 degrees. I wouldn't hike up it. That'd be too steep for me to hike. And they are a very precocial species. They hit the ground running. So as you can see, probably two days old, just scrambling right up this slope, no problem. They're born fully with feathers and their intestines are ready to accept insects and food right away. They do grow, oh, sorry, here's a photo of a mama hen. She is, you can see she's kind of, her wings are kind of bushed out a little bit and she's sitting on six little ptarmigan chicks, brooding them, keeping them protect, protected from predators, from strong winds, from hailstorms, and from cold nighttime temperatures. Ptarmigan chicks grow extremely fast. They grow their first eight primaries. They're little gray primaries within the first seven to 10 days of life, and they can fly at about one week old. Um, after about two weeks, they'll molt those first gray eight primaries out, and they'll grow in 10 permanent white primaries, which they'll molt out again after one year. This chick is probably about six weeks old. You can see the mama hen down on the right and the chick up here in the top left. And even at six weeks old, they're almost full size. They're probably about three quarters of, of full size. And again, kind of flocking up and sticking together. And one of the mechanisms that the mother hens use to keep the brood tight, keep everyone together, is the chicks will will cry out a distress call. And the mother will often respond. She has different vocalizations, but <gasps> is often what she'll, she'll say in response. And she has different variations of that for come back to me or hunker down, there's an avian predator, or other variations indicating what the chicks should do to kind of stay tight as a family group. The summer diet consists, for adults, consists of forbs and grasses, alpine avens, uh, those little yellow flowers you can see, uh, American bistort, you know, they kind of look like little cotton Q-tips. Um, they also eat a lot of sedge, rush, and grass seed heads, as, weather, as well as other flowers and plants. The little chicklings, for the first week of life, they're pretty much exclusively restricted to insects for that rich protein source. 
And as their large intestine elongates after one week, they start switching over to more of a plant-based diet. They'll eat insects kind of for the first, you know, two, three, four weeks, and then after that, they'll switch completely over to an adult diet. So after the chicks get big, late summer, those leaves are starting to senesce, everything's turning reddish and golden brown. It's time to join a flock. Everyone group up and molt their feathers again. There's an example of kind of the fall plumage uh, turning into that more of that mottled grayish brown and kind of blending in again, camouflaging with the background. And at this time also, a lot of the birds start molting some white feathers into there, into that mix. And at this time, you'll see later we had some birds that we didn't know the sex. It was probably at this time of year because you can no longer tell the males from the females. So that's the, the kind of life and natural history portion. I'm going to move into the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, what we did for the last seven years looking at these guys. Um, the whole premise of the project is that there was a proposal to the US Fish and Wildlife Service to list these guys under the Endangered Species Act. Because so little information had been collected in the last 30 years in the state of Colorado, my supervisor, Amy Segland, put together a first an occupancy study and then a, uh, an abundance and population study looking at these guys. We did identify five, five key threats um, that threaten the viability and longevity of the species, climate change kind of being the big looming nasty one, one that we have through personal actions some control over but on a large scale less control over. That will be more of a something we have to manage rather than mitigate. Uh, hunting is definitely something we have control over. Uh, mining, historically, Colorado is a mining <coughs> state. There are mine wreckage and mining buildings, mine tailing piles all throughout the state. There was a study that came out about cadmium and plants uptaking cadmium. Uh, animals that eat the plants with high levels of cadmium are suspect to developing brittle bone disease. So that's something in mine cleanup we could address and think about. Um, one big one that we saw throughout the years of our study is increased re recreation in the alpine. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then also one of the threats is domestic sheep grazing. There are a lot of allotments from the Forest Service and the BLM for domestic sheep grazing in the Alpine. And those, have been, those permits have been decreasing over the years, but it's still something that we identified as a threat and we need to continue thinking about. So the objectives of our study were to evaluate the distribution evaluate the genetic diversity and connectivity between subpopulations, and assess the population size statewide and the demographic parameters. And one, just one side note, one interesting fact about this photo here is you can see both birds have their eyes slightly cocked towards the, the sky, and that's a very characteristic head position when there's an avian predator flying over. And their biggest defense is not to fly, it's to hunker down and to camouflage. So if you ever see a ptarmigan cocking its head to the eye, it's probably detecting an avian predator and it'll probably just melt back into the rocks soon after. So in 2011, we put together an occupancy sampling uh, project. We had very large plots. We modeled the habitat with a predicted rain, range model and we selected 50% suitable habitat um, based on that range model. We selected, uh, we randomly selected plots throughout the state and we did sample the plots two times just to make sure we caught everything there was to catch and also to determine our probability of detection. And we used those playbacks that I've played both of them for you. I won't pierce your eardrums a second time, but we did use those playbacks to assist us in the detection. So here you can see kind of a, our plots, these little yellow boxes, they were all arrayed statewide, 
We really tried to uh, you know, vary the distribution and sample all of the ranges of mountains in the state. We also collected data within 100 meters of the observation to try to inform uh, how we were searching for birds and also inform researchers in the future. So we took notes on site characteristics such as distance to snow, willow, uh, percentage of talus and boulder cover, distance to cliffs, the different vegetative types such as alpine meadow or grasslands or wet meadow, that sort of thing, as well as recording the elevation. And then we also recorded the anthropogenic or uh, disturbance from predators in the area. So the results of our, occupant, our plot occupancy were extremely successful. We found birds in 57 of the 59 plots um, in the first sampling period. In the second sampling period, it appears we found them everywhere. And our, we had an extremely high detection probability which for a camouflage species, that's, that is a very good thing. And what we also found is kind of obviously, it's an alpine species, 94% of them were found in the alpine. And then I think the most striking thing for finding ptarmigan is where. 82% were found within 100 meters of talus. So if you're ever seeking out ptarmigan, that margin, that, that margin of where the talus and the vegetation meet, that is the highest likelihood of finding a ptarmigan. We did find a moderate amount of human disturbance, a larger amount of predators in the alpine, and also the elevation that these guys live at seemed to be extremely consistent, somewhere between 11,500 and 13,000 with that 12 to 12.5 12 range being the highest likelihood of finding ptarmigan. So the conclusions from that first year study, white-tailed ptarmigan are indeed well distributed throughout the state. There were no changes in the distribution. There was a, an extensive study done in the 1970s. No, no difference, no change in distribution from that study. And we had high detection probabilities for the species. As part of that, we also collected feathers, and with the feathers, what we were trying to determine were fine-scale genetic differences. What we did see in the genetic differences is that there are two distinct subpopulations. We have the northern subpopulation in yellow. We have the southern subpopulation in the San Juans in red. And we suspect there's a lack of suitable ha alpine habitat between the two which reduces that gene flow and the availability of uh, the birds mixing and dispersing. So overall, we did see that the connectivity appears adequate to maintain the genetic diversity. We did see a high degree of genetic diversity, heterozygosity, and allelic ri richness. There were no indications of small population sizes, no deleterious effects of inbreeding, and we did have two isolated locations that had slightly lower heterozygosity and allelic richness, and those were the flat tops and the song grays. I'll jump back, just kind of point those out, and you can see the flat tops here, they're quite far from any of their neighbors, and then the song grays. And those are also, you know, this is a huge gap huge lowland gap. We did see slightly lower genetic diversity there, and that's just something to remember and take into consideration if those populations are ever in trouble. So the following six years of our study was a capture mark recite study, and we did assist ourselves with radio telemetry, and we used these techniques to measure abundance, survival, and breeding success of the birds. So we had six total survey sites. We did separate them, three in the north and three in the south, so we were kind of sampling equally between those two different subpopulations. And we had three different survey periods per year. We had the mating or breeding period kind of in uh, June and early, early July, the brood rearing period being late July into kind of mid-August, and then the fall molt and flock up period about mid-August through mid to late September. 
our field methods. We got to capture tons of birds. How we did this was you can see that this uh, tech has a 15 foot pole, has a tiny noose loop to slip, slip over the head on the very end of it. What you do is you sneak up as best as you can and loop it over the bird's head and pull it in as fast as you can, subdue the wings and slip the noose off the head, which leads into each bird got unique band identification. This one is from our Byers Peak site up uh, off of Berthed Pass. That's our Broncos bird. <laughs> and every single bird we banded had a different either color band combination or in the later years of the study, we had color bands with numbers on them. So every single in individual was identifiable. Over the course of six years, we captured 637 birds and marked them. We had slightly fewer females, slightly more males. We had 11 unknowns. Those were probably captured in the fall. We had no idea how to sex them. <clears throat> and on a select number of individuals, we put radio collars on that we could track them around. We used the radio telemetry to determine movement and survival, the nest and the brood success. And as you can see, we used handheld receivers with these Yagi 3 antennas. And I want to say we had more than 2,900 on the ground visual detections and nest locations for birds. And then in the winter, or if the birds moved off of our study site, we utilized um, one of the state resources. We have airplanes in the four regions of the state and we did utilize the airplane for winter locations or if they moved off our study sites. So we used the mark resite to inform the abundance and the population numbers, and we used telemetry to inform the demographics. And what we saw is the abundance. You can see it kind of trends like most animal populations. They do trend up and down, up and down but they do tend to stabilize out over time. So the yellow, that's the northern population, the red, that's the southern population, and then the total abundance estimate, it kind of ranges from just below 150,000 to about 225,000 statewide. Broken down into our six study sites, and you can see that the population trends kind of maintained that same curve really good year, highly abundant in 2013. That winter was kind of a lousy low snow year, and we did see pretty much all of our population numbers kind of dip down in 2014. And all of them follow that same population trend over time, but you'll notice that this one site, Ofer, did not follow the same trend. We saw decreasing numbers over every single year of our study, and we, we, we suspect that it may be due to recreation in the Alpine. That Ofer site is right outside of Silver, Silverton in the San Juan Mountains, and it is one of the most spectacularly beautiful basins you've ever seen. It's a place called Ice Lake. I want to say it was featured in an article in Outside Magazine probably five years ago, and it was interesting to watch from 2011 until 2017 we saw numbers of maybe 50 hikers per day. When we finished our, our, our study, we were seeing 150, 200, 250. I mean, the parking lots were overflowing. It's almost as if recreationalists are loving the place to death. It's so spectacularly beautiful. But we also saw an increase of off-trail hiking. We saw downhill mountain biking. We saw a lot of peak bagging. We saw dogs off leash chasing birds, you know, dogs that are not under voice command of their owner. And we really do kind of correlate that, that increased recreation and kind of the irresponsible recreation for that decrease in numbers at that site. So another part of the study was determining the reproductive success of the birds. We had 92 radio collared females. This is Helen. She is calling her chicks in. And one chick is so vigilant, it's on mama's back. 
We had 92 radio collared females. We followed them 2013 to 2017. We did monitor 115 different nests throughout that time. And we learned a lot about nest substrate through that time. 51% were right next to rocks or <coughs> boulders, kind of tucked in, sheltered from the wind and the elements. 34% were under willow or other types of shrubs. Um, and generally speaking, the ones that were under willows or shrubs, they were kind of right on the edge, on the margin of the willows or shrubs. So if a predator did kind of sneak up, they could just pop out and run away. 12% were on open ground. I speculate they may or may be less successful on broad open ground. And then three were down in the crumb holes in those flagged trees. And those 3% are probably due to a high snowpack, and that was the first available area for nesting. We have a ptarmigan hiding under the marsh marigolds. This lady, she chose an open ground nest right next to that tall bunch grass. Sheltered from the wind right next to a boulder. If you walked by that, you'd probably never see her. I know doing telemetry sometimes, you'd get a signal and you'd walk around in circles for five minutes and you just couldn't find her. There we have another one kind of nestled in the talus there, very well camouflaged in the center of the screen. And then one of those classic willow shrub bushes or nests. So the incubation date, the initiation of incubation varied from June 11th to July 12th, and that was predominantly based on snowpack. A ptarmigan is not going to nest in this. It's going to wait another three weeks for open patches of ground and suitable habitat to nest in. And that was pretty much all due to the snowpack of the year. So the average clutch size, 5.46 is kind of a funny number. You're never going to see half an egg. But five or six eggs was pretty, pretty average, pretty common for the first clutch. They do only lay one clutch per year unless the nest is unsuccessful. If it's early enough, the bird will try to re-nest. When they re-nest, they usually have only two or three eggs on average. But for a first nest attempt, the average 5.46, we did count 409 eggs total, 95% of which were viable. If the nest got to the hatching period, 95% of chicks came out of the eggs. But the probability of the nest succeeding was actually pretty average for birds, which is kind of low. It's only about 39% plus or minus 9%. And you may wonder why. Well, this little cutie might be to blame. Interesting anecdote about weasels in the Alpine is in 2013, it was a very, very big winter. And the following summer, we saw a huge boost in the pika population. I mean, there were pika everywhere. You couldn't even take five steps without practically kicking one. Now the next year, in 2014, that was kind of that low population year for white-tailed ptarmigan, but we saw a ton of weasels in the alpine. So we kind of speculate it could be, you know, that, that predator-prey cyclical population relationship may have been partially due to weasels predating nests. In addition to that, there were good mothers, there were bad mothers. Some mothers were extremely vigilant. They would hatch out five chicks and you would find them a month later. They'd only lost one. They'd have four chicks. Some mothers would run away from their own chicks. Some would completely ignore chick distress calls, while other mothers would adopt chicks in. You'd see them one day with six chicks, the next day they would have 13. I think that was the highest number we ever saw. This baby, obviously very vigilant. Mama looks like she's calling in the rest of the family. So again, the movement of ptarmigan. We determined the movement of them by these radio collars. Like I said, we had over 2,900 locations with boots on the ground in the summer, 
430 utilizing the airplane in the winter. And you can see they really held tight to those elevations. 12 to 13,000 feet, very, very common for the summer. And then just barely moving down, maybe 500 to 1,500 feet in the winter. And another interesting thing we saw is that the average distance moved is always higher for females and they also have a higher mortality. There could be a relationship there. The highest movement we ever saw from a female was 53 kilometers in a winter. And I think that maximum movement also kind of informs the reason why there's those two distinct subpopulations. Because the distance between the San Juans and say the Sangres or the West Elks is greater than 55 kilometers when we never saw a bird jump that gap. So that could inform why there are those two distinct subpopulations. And the males, they really liked to stay put. They're kind of homebodies. The greatest movement we ever saw in winter was just under 10 kilometers. And they do have a higher survival. Why do you think they move more in winter? Um, I think it's either where their, their parents go, like where the mother takes them to winter forage, or it's for better availability of winter feeding grounds. Because where we'd see them move were huge bottomland willow cars. I mean, huge, huge, expansive swaths of willow car. Cool. So the conclusions from that portion, the Markree site and telemetry, the northern and southern populations are changing similarly through time, nothing to be alarmed about. The, there was evidence of population decline at that high recreation site, the Ofer site. There were higher densities of birds than previous studies in that study in the 1970s. It's unclear why that is, um, whether our search effort were, was greater, whether we spent more time in the field. Either way, it indicates that our birds are doing quite well in the state. And the reproductive out, output was mainly driven by predation, possibly weasels, possibly red fox in the alpine, possibly avian predators. Our overall conclusions from the entire seven-year study, the white-tailed ptarmigan is a very re resilient species. These guys are going to stick around as long as they possibly can. Our results didn't diverge dramatically from the historic efforts, and the statewide species status is secure. We are working on developing a long-term monitoring plan to continually assess changes in distribution and evaluate demographic parameters as the environment does change. And some important considerations, kind of the, the take-home take message is to develop adap adaptive practices to manage increased human recreation. That's a big one. Continue to monitor domestic ungulate grazing especially in the face of changing climate and changing landscapes, and to kind of stay on top of easily accessed hunting sites to make sure they're not overexploited and kind of assess those potential effects. With that, I would like to, I'd like to first of all acknowledge my supervisor, Amy Segland, for putting the whole project together and keeping me on as her field crew lead for the whole project. I'd like to recognize Phil Street is in the middle there. He did most of the analysis for his master's and PhD part of that project uh, and did a great job with it. Lee Kaiser and Serena Roxand were two of the other technicians that worked for the entirety of the project. Our faithful winter pilot, Steve Waters, was always a pleasure to fly with. And then all of the other volunteers, all of the computer geniuses like Michelle Flenner and uh, Greg Wan, his assistants really guided and informed our entire project. And the original ptarmigan researcher that did all of those studies in the 70s is a famous man named Clayt Braun. Can't give enough thanks to him. With that, I'd love to take questions. I'm going to pass around this microphone. Um, just make sure that you have it close to your chin, the way I have it. And just raise your hand, and I'll give you the microphone.
I have two questions that might be related. Uh, one is, like, what can you tell us about the timing of the molting and what drives that? Um, and then the second question is, you mentioned that climate change is one of the biggest threats. Can you talk more about the mechanisms behind that? Does it, like, last three days? What's, what's the deal? So the timing of the molt into nuptial plumage, that is driven by two factors. It's driven by the increasing photo period, and it's also driven by snow melt. And we think it's the, the albedo in the snow, the high reflectivity in the snow, actually aids in the timing of the molt. If you have more snow, you'll see the birds stay white longer, and as the snow recedes, they'll start to molt more. But it's initiated by that increased photo period. But it's kind of an interplay between the two. And the second, let's see, the second, the effects of climate change overall long term. Um, you know, that's a big unknown kind of in the world. Maybe not climate warming, climate weirding. We may see changes in afternoon thunderstorms. And these birds are very susceptible to heat stress. I want to say 104 degrees is where they pff, drop dead. But um, at 80 degrees, they do have mechanisms. They like to kind of shelter themselves next to talus and next to large boulders where it's a little bit cooler. And they do pant a lot to help cool themselves off. And they'll kind of stay put during the daytime to help cool their bodies. Um, other potential changes we could see is an, an encroaching tree line uh, as climate warms and possibly dries out. So that would be a, a big key factor there's evidence of dusky grouse encroaching in New Mexico where their tree line is a little bit lower. And that could have some interesting interplay. Who knows, there could be some, some uh, interbreeding between the species or there, they could be eliminated entirely. Um, another factor we could see is changes in vegetative community where fo forb dominated areas turn more to grass dominated areas and that could limit their diet. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the reverse, decreased photo period and then increase in snow. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned uh, hunting. Um, how much hunting, I've, I've, I've been in Colorado almost all my life and I've seen um, folks out hunting for, for grouse mm -hmm. um, lower down, you know, in the, in the trees. But never have I seen anybody hunting for ptarmigan. Is there, a, um, is there a very limited amount of hunting that goes on? How much hunting is there, and what's the time of, of year that that's done? Um, I want to say there are, I know there are two different hunting periods. There's one period that's in September. I believe it's a two-week season. I may be incorrect. It may be a three-week season. There's a second season in October that's generally to um, try and collect a white bird. Um, and from what I've heard, I have a, a couple of friends that are upland game enthusiasts. They're not really a sporting species. You find them and they just kind of sit there. And what fun is it to just, you know, just off something that's just sitting there. So it, from what I've heard, I've never hunted ptarmigan myself. I, I don't think I'd be into that. But from what I've heard, it's kind of a one and done experience. People that hunt ptarmigan, you know, they might do it once and then, okay, that was off my life list for hunting. But we do see a lot of hunting pressure at easily accessed sites. There's sites up near Fort Collins, a place ca called Crown Point, that sees a lot of hunting pressure. Places like Mount Evans or Independence Pass, you know, the roads go right up to where the birds are. So we do see a lot of hunting pressure in select areas, but not kind of widespread. You had a question. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious if you've noted any impacts by bird watchers playing, um, trying to call them in, or just their presence being around. Um, what should we all know about taking care of ptarmigans while we enjoy watching them in the field? Um, don't chase them, <laughs> ever. And don't let your dog chase them. Um, honestly, I have never, I've never observed anyone playing callbacks other than us as researchers. 
and people usually look at us like we're Looney Tunes, <laughs> Play, you know, playing these screeching calls in the middle of the day, hiking around, looking under rocks, and you know, staring at the ground. I haven't really observed any effects from other bird watchers. Um, in my opinion, bird enthusiasts tend to be extremely respectful. So I really haven't seen any, any effects um, by bird watching enthusiasts. Uh, you mentioned the red fox and the weasel as predator and avian predators. Mm -hmm. I was curious about what avian predators you've observed and if you've observed any like actual uh, ptarmigans being taken because mm -hmm. it seems like if a bird could, because they, do, they don't go anywhere, I've mm -hmm. observed. Um, I would say the <laughs> primary predators, avian predators in the Alpine are prairie falcons. We also see golden eagles and red-tailed hawk pretty frequently in the Alpine. Um, we did see uh, two males territorially fighting in the spring one year, and immediately a prairie falcon comes out of nowhere and picks one off. And so we have observed predation. Um, another way we determine avian predation is from the radio collared birds. You can determine from the kill site uh, what took it, either a mammalian predator or an avian predator. Um, other birds, <laughs> during the raptor migration in the fall, you'll see just hosts of other species of birds coming through and searching those north-south ridge lines. But the main ones, I would say, are prairie falcons, <laughs> golden eagles, and red-tailed hawk. Are they at all affected by parasites? You know, we saw very, very low parasites on their feathers. Probably out of our 637 birds, I think we recorded maybe 20 that had parasites. They're not suspect parasites hardly at all, which is really nice handling so many birds. <laughs> all right, any other questions? Thanks. You may have mentioned this, and I might have missed it, but um, life expectancy? So the oldest recorded ptarmigan is 12 years old from a previous study. The oldest I ever saw was it was a four-leg band bird, which indicates to me it was banded in 2012, our first year of leg banding. And my partner and I were hiking up at Ice Lake this year, and we found a four-banded bird. So the l oldest I've seen is seven, but the oldest recorded is 12. Why were they introduced in the 70s to places where they had not been? Uh, you know, it's kind of what uh, the state agency was doing at the time. They were, they were moving animals around. I'm not sure the logic behind it, but that was just kind of something that was being done with a lot of different species at the time. Um, it was ex successful in the Uintas and in New Mexico. The other three populations, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, and at Pikes Peak, the one in Oregon and the one in the Sierras didn't take. It seems like a lot of your conclusions were aligned very well with the last comprehensive study in the 70s. I'm mm -hmm. curious if there was anything to you that was surprising spending so much time in the Alpine, whether about the the biodiversity there, or the community, or the behavior of ptarmigans? Was there anything that was unexpected? Um, you know, I think the biggest surprise I had was how big the flocks get in the fall. You, you'll be hiking around. We had uh, five study days per survey period. And in the fall, you would hike around for one or two days and not see any birds. And then all of a sudden, you'd see 35 altogether. And so the flock size was really surprising to me. I didn't expect that after finding ptarmigan everywhere all summer and kind of knowing where to look, and then just getting skunked for days, and then finding 35. So that was, for me, that was the most surprising thing. Any last questions? Um, last question, for, for me at least. Um, You've got a huge amount of terrain there in that picture at 
12 to 13,000 feet. Uh -huh. In order to establish or maybe guesstimate the number of birds in the state, mm -hmm. did you actually look at a topographic map and calculate how much of the whole area in Colorado is at 12 to 13,000 feet? And then yes. from your studies, you know, try to figure out how many birds per square kilometer there was? Is, mm -hmm. that, is that how it was so done? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back to a slide really quick. And it's pretty early on. It's the predicted range map. And basically, using ArcGIS, um, this map was developed. It was all of the area you know, above 12,000 feet. From that, it was extrapolated how much would be suitable habitat, so less than 50% rock. I'm not sure what the exact parameters were. But they used this predicted range map, and then we we estimated the entire population with those six years of data from six specific different sites. And the reason we had five day study periods three times a year was we tried to mark every single bird we could in that study site. And generally speaking, by the end of our five day periods, we would only find maybe one, maybe two birds that we just couldn't capture. And in addition to that, we informed uh, how the birds were moving with that radio telemetry. So we could estimate how much the birds were moving on and off the sites and potentially how many birds we were missing. So we kind of put all of those numbers and all those pieces of the puzzle together in order to come up with this statewide estimation. Great. Um, can we give another round of applause for Kat, please? <laughs>